At the turn of the 16th century, Dutch painter and draftsman Hieronymus Bosch delved deep into the abyss of his mind to conjure up one of the most sensational displays of demonology ever seen. The triptych altarpiece, The Temptations of St. Anthony. Bosch lays open a vast discourse on the lifelong temptations of a Christian monk called Anthony. Anthony was born in 251 AD in Lower Egypt. After the death of his parents, he gave up all his possessions and began a life of solitude in the Libyan desert. His first retreat was a tomb where he spent the days in prayer and where he endured fierce demonic assaults. Emerging triumphant from boredom, laziness, and dreams of lustful women, Anthony crossed the Nile to live in the abandoned ruins of a mountain fort, where he stayed in almost total isolation for 20 years. Anthony spent the remainder of his life working for the Christian cause. He built a monastic system, comforted persecuted Christians, and opposed Christological heresies. At the age of 105, he returned to his mountain refuge, fell ill, and before dying, instructed his disciples to bury him in secret. Throughout the centuries, artists have produced work on the subject of Anthony and his temptations. Based on literary sources such as the Lives of the Desert Fathers, the Golden Legend, and the Life of Saint Anthony by Athanasius of Alexandria. Euronymous Bosch was no doubt compelled by the richness of Anthony's story and by its moral and spiritual significance. In the late Middle Ages, people believed that suffering was neither gratuitous nor arbitrary, that famine, plague, war, and overall instability was God's punishment for their sins, and led to a feeling that the end of the world was near. Credit was given to divinatory arts, superstitious practices, the promised miracles of alchemists, and the undertakings of necromancers. In the Temptations of Saint Anthony, Bosch gave expression to the spiritual unrest of his time, making powerful allusions that aimed to expose the viewer to the absurdities of sin, objectifying the conflict between good, represented by the saint and Christ, and evil in the vile acts performed by demonic creatures. Bosch painted the outer panels of the Temptations of St. Anthony in Griseo. The stone-like appearance of the Passion scenes are in keeping with the Lenten theme. Prayer, penance, mortification of the flesh, almsgiving and denial of ego make up the sacrifice of Lent, replicating the account of Christ's journey into the desert. In the left outer panel, a band of armed troops imprisons the Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. The figures make wild gestures, contort their faces, and turn in all directions. A soldier handles the girdle of Jesus as if it were a harness. Another pulls a strap around the Lord's neck. Judas makes his exit, the payment for his betrayal hanging in his purse. A brook runs the width of the painting. A mantle rests on its bank. A wooden board serves as a bridge to the foreground, where an enraged Peter raises a sword to cut off the ear of Malchus. A chalice rests upon a hilltop as a testimony to what happens below. An attribute of faith personified the chalice is the ritual vessel used in the Eucharist to hold wine, a symbol of Christ's blood. 
The arrest of Christ takes place before daybreak, as the moon, mistress of all living things, is seen among the dark clouds. The moon, which is born new, grows to maturity, dies, and after the third night of darkness, is resurrected. The right outer panel shows Jesus fallen under the weight of the cross on the way to Calvary. Soldiers with various trappings, weapons, and shields surround the Christ. Helping to hold the cross is Simon of Cyrene. Veronica holds up the sedaria, the cloth which received the miraculous transfer of the Lord's face after wiping his sweat and blood. To the right of the group, a corpulent man carries a naked child on his shoulders and holds another by the hand. In the foreground of the scene, the penitent thief, about to be taken by a guard, heeds to the earnest entreaties of a confessor. The unrepentant thief, who is blindfolded, does not heed to what is professed. The land on which these scenes take place is barren. Nothing grows where the earth is desecrated. The remains of death scattered upon the ground allude to a place of execution. Idle ravens, a dead pig hanging upside down, a head stuck on a withered branch, a beggar dying, his leg swinging loosely on a T-shaped pole. Jesus, the living exemplar of all that is good, was betrayed, disgraced, tortured, and then killed. The tragedy of this story, depicted on the outer panels, serves as the prototype for Anthony's ordeal. The Passion of the Christ is the prologue for the entire triptych altarpiece. A land flooded over and in flames, delivered to chaos and the forces of evil. Amidst the ruins of the past and the sins of the present, where demons swarm the heavens and populate the earth, it is a world no longer ruled by divine order, but at the mercy of the devil's craziest whims. A left-to-right movement leads across the three panels as the story unfolds. Anthony embarks on his life as a hermit, Anthony at the height of his persecution by the devils, and Anthony having conquered all temptations to attain the ecstasy of transcendence. The left inner panel depicts Anthony's initial battles with the forces of evil. This is Anthony's Golgotha, a hopeless upside-down world of waste, stagnation, and absurd proportions. While at prayer, Anthony saw himself carried aloft by good angels, only to be attacked by demons, holding him accountable for his past sins preventing him from achieving celestial ascension. This wolf head suggests the Egyptian god of death, Anubis, who guided the souls of the dead into the afterlife. A creature remindful of disease and pestilence makes use of a scythe. The fish, symbol of Christianity, being wielded as a battering ram. The boat is the vehicle that carries the souls of the dead to the afterlife, into underworlds, across celestial oceans, or floating down rivers towards infinity. A fiendish crew mans a ship whose mast is broken, the whole structure mounted on a whale's back. These are the creatures to carry Anthony to hell, but in spite of the ambush, the saint remains unaffected, deep in contemplative bliss. After being almost beaten to death by demons, 
Anthony is carried back to safety by two fellow monks and a third man. The profound dejection of the figures evokes a keen sense of hopelessness, in parallel to the station of the cross. The figures are crossing a bridge over a small frozen brook. The brook represents the winter of consciousness, and the bridge, Anthony's passage from worldly life to the life of the spirit. He is a pilgrim of the soul on the road to self-discovery and redemption, to what demands to be found within his heart. Under the bridge, a diabolical cleric reads out a list of accusations. The document with a red seal attached to it resembles an indulgence, a paid certificate that promised to reduce the amount of punishment people had to undergo for their sins. A practice deplored by would-be church reformers. A hellish bird with an upturned funnel on its head crosses the ice to deliver another document. Ice skates were a metaphor in literature and art in the late Middle Ages to signify that the world had gone astray, slipping on thin ice and falling through into freezing waters. A pelican swallows live the hatchlings that come out of a large egg, an inversion of what this bird stands for in Christian iconography, charity and self-sacrifice. The egg is a symbol of resurrection because the chick breaks from it at birth, just as Christ broke forth from his tomb. Formed of three fish, each swallowing one smaller than itself, an armored vehicle on grasshopper legs and a church steeple on its top propels itself forward, helped by large shield-like wheels. The driver handles a rod from which a ball hangs, like a carrot placed before the nose of a donkey. Anthony's tomb in the wilderness was turned into a tavern or a brothel. Its supporting structure is a man on all fours, a giant crawling painfully as a thick arrow is lodged in his forehead. The tavern represents a diabolical trap for humans, a long pole to prod sinners into its hollow. This group of evil-looking clergymen ascends a path that leads to that place of iniquity. Anthony's calling was to live a life of contemplation and to practice the virtues of love, compassion and humility. No matter how hard the devil tried to make Anthony abandon these virtues, the saint would refuse to give in to such a detestable master. But the fight was far from over. The central panel shows Anthony at the height of his battle with the forces of evil, who appear in large numbers to tempt, torment, and destroy. Seeking ever greater solitude, Anthony chose an old Roman fort for his hermitage, but soon fell prey to the demons who had reclaimed the ravaged building. Anthony's fort is laid open in the manner of a theatrical set, the roof and front wall removed to reveal the action on the center stage, the theater of a spiritual war within Anthony's mind that Bosch turns inside out. The state of decay of the fort shows that nothing earthly lasts, that all things become corrupt and perish the presence of Christ within the walls betokens the new faith which developed roots, spread and grew. Just as nature takes its course, 
growing from the crumbling bodies of empires. From pillars of temples to the sand of deserts, where the hermit dwells, where he prays and contemplates the stars. Anthony appears in the dead center of the panel, kneeling half reclined against the parapet wall of the fort. In imitation of Jesus, Anthony raises his hand in blessing, leading our eyes towards the Christ standing in the hollow of the chapel beside an altar bearing a crucifix. A candle is lit, and a beam of light, whose source is a burning village in the background, pierces through a window to tell Anthony that no matter how overwhelming circumstances become, he has the Lord to look upon. Around the kneeling Anthony, a cohort of demons conduct an elaborate perversion of the Catholic Mass, a parade of folly suggestive of the witch's Sabbath, complete with sermon, music, communion, and almsgiving. The powerful scene is redolent of shamanic spirit battles and journeys of the mind, of carnivalesque rituals where fools, wild men, animals, witches, and local demons invert or mock the behavior of other times of the year. Features distorted by hatred, mendacity, and malice make manifest the ugliness of evil. The priestesses of Satan serve the bread and the wine of the Eucharist. A serpentine-tailed woman, a thorny vine trailing down her back, kneels beside Anthony, offering a silver dish to a nun. The woman with a Medusa-like tiara holds a golden cup containing the wine. A white dish is raised, a toad, a form the devil was believed to assume, holds up an egg, mocking the wafer of the Eucharist. An owl, a symbol of heresy, rests upon the head of a pig-faced lute player, Holding on to him is a crippled hurdy-gurdy man. Small dog wearing bells and a jester's cap completes this maniacal ensemble. In the late Middle Ages, secular music was associated with debauchery, standing in direct contrast to sacred music, meant to exalt God. The hurdy-gurdy and the lute were among those instruments said to be played in hell. Wearing the top hat and the red cape of a magician, a bearded beggar sets out his amputated foot in the hopes of attracting arms. The presence of crippled people must have been common at the time of Bosch. The cut-off limbs was an appalling aspect of ergotism, a disease caused by eating grain contaminated with the ergot fungus. A figure wearing metal gauntlets and carrying a hunting bow holds by the wing a panic-stricken creature brought to the Sabbath as a sacrifice. This band of demons has come to accuse, condemn, and execute. A breaking wheel, still bearing parts of a corpse, testifies to that purpose. To the right of the platform, a pig-snouted figure with priestly robes, joined in sacrilege by two other devils, recites from the dark pages of a book. His rotten entrails are spilling out of his chasuble, as if to expose the fact that men of the church were among those who served the devil. A half-derelict tower stands to the right of the fort, decorated in motifs of gold and bronze, memorializing passages of the Old Testament.
Out of the clouds, the hand of God gives Moses the tables of the law. At the foot of the mountain, people dance around the golden calf. An ape is venerated and given offerings. A giant cluster of grapes is brought from the land of Cana. The scenes of the Old Testament stand side by side to the New Testament of Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. At the foot of the tower, a cavalcade of demons makes its way through the shallows. A thistle-headed falconer rides a jug-bellied beast, a sinful vessel spilling foulness from its backside. A sickly figure side-saddles a giant rat, the body formed by a dead hollow tree, encasing a child wrapped in strips of linen, already marked for death. An enclosed bridge forms a passageway between the fort and an egg-shaped building looming over the water. Nested structures, each bursting out of the other, crowned with a dovecot, a flaming lantern on its roof. A withered branch supports a large canvas top, laid open as if to reveal the reproductive part of an exotic plant. Under its cover, a group of monks indulge in drinking. A naked figure is about to throw himself into the water with great alacrity, as if to indicate the willing fall of man. These are not the cleansing ablutions of the spiritually minded, but the shameless immersions in the black waters of sin. A clock with the signs of the zodiac displays the hour most appropriate to evil doing. The symbols resemble the magic letters used on the pentacles of necromancers. A shape recurrent in the art of Euronymous Bosch is the receptacle form, the husk, the bowl, the vessel, the hollowed out fruit, a motif which exposes the tension between concealment and disclosure. The big gourd shaped fruit is an allusion to the flask of the alchemist, containing nothing but profane chemistry. The red fruit also alludes to the apple equated in the Middle Ages with the temptation and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. People feared that such a fruit harbored devils and foul creatures, and eating it was the perfect agent for the transmission of sin. An incensed mannequin wields a sword, representing the deadly sin of anger. A green-cloaked devil profanes the angelic harp, Creatures both real and imaginary come to drink at the water's edge. Fishcraft plow the murky waters, maneuvered by a crew of monkey-like creatures. The wily and mischievous monkey, with its propensity for anger and ill intent, is a symbol of chaotic, unguided action. A myopic figure whose hands serve as a paddling mechanism. A nefarious creature handles a sail with a stingray threaded onto the canvas. A carp, outfitted with a red cloak and armored plates, gasps for air. A monkey figure paddles it with a long spoon, while another reaps its unclean reward from the waters. This stumpy little character, cross-eyed, mouth-twisted in agony, is the picture of madness. 
The emissaries of the Antichrist take to the sky to bring the fire and brimstone of the apocalypse. Leading the devil's army is a figure which could represent Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, and one of the seven princes of hell. This is the fate of the unfaithful, understood as divine punishment. The demons lay waste to a once happy place, a village destroyed for the impiety of its inhabitants. A church is attacked, the steeple is being pulled down, a defenseless congregation gathered together to witness the hideous spectacle. The woods glow with the blaze, people rush away into the trees. Some parts of the village are unaffected, and people carry on with their daily activities. Everything is obscured by smoke, the darkness transitioning to blues and greys as it gives way to clear sky. Two flying craft head towards each other, belligerent conveyances precariously held together by the efforts of a self-sacrificing crew. The volatile nature of man leading him to war and destruction. In spite of the unholy ritual being forced upon him, Anthony is fully present and unmoved. Fearless and alert in spirit, his heart never pierced by the black arrow of evil. He removes himself from the chaos, from the illusory nature of the reality that surrounds him. He looks out of the picture, his gaze meeting those who wish to acknowledge that it is possible to exercise mastery and self-control in the face of everything that conspires against us. In the right panel, we find an older Anthony, sitting quietly on a grassy bank with an open Bible in his hand, not allowing himself to be distracted by the apparitions around him. Up in the sky, man and woman ride a fish, leaving behind a trail of sparks. Witches were widely believed to have the power of flight. They were thought to fly to their gatherings on brooms, staves, or animals. The sky descends onto distant hills, background to a well-delineated Netherlandish town, opening a wide esplanade reaching the walls where two imposing towers stand. One of them has a fire burning on its summit, and an army is laying siege to the other. A dark lagoon serves as a moat. The remnants of drowned men are emblematic of the consequences of armed conflict. In the water, a man fights off a dragon-like beast, fighting for one's life against the dark forces, wielding the sword of the spirit, aiming to cut off at one blow all earthly affections. The devil launched his most powerful attack on the saintly hermit by appearing in the shape of a beautiful woman bathing in a stream deep in the desert. Woman, offspring of water, the choice snare of men, exercising tyranny even upon tyrants themselves. A naked seductress looks out from within the labial shapes of a hollow tree, split open to reveal all its charms. The gash, the gate of the sky or the maw of hell, the antechamber where the woman stands, between salvation and the womb of perdition. The upper branch of the tree curved like a beckoning finger to lure Anthony away from his life of devotion. A red cloak is draped over the tree, the outer folds of a trapping structure, a Venus trap, 
preparing to close in once the victim is firmly secured. This is the Tree of Damnation, its vulva cavity the entrance of a tomb. The woman, a deathly pale figurine of anemic sensuality, as wispy as the barely visible veil covering her lower parts. A procuress, the hag of Satan dealing in human flesh, bears a pasty smile on her face and pours wine into the cup of a salacious looking toad creature. Sex to satisfy urges, wine to forget one's troubles, and food to fill the belly. A man raises a ladder onto the tree, not the ladder of virtue or spiritual ascension, for the branch will break and the fall is certain. A round table, held up by naked members of the clergy, is set in the foreground. One man lies on his back, a sword being thrust through his neck. Another supports the table on his shoulder, his lower legs scalded, to indicate the burning sensations of Saint Anthony's fire. A horn that swallows another gives off noxious fumes for music. A demon holds up the other side of the table. A toad emerges from under the cloth, desecrating the foods designed to tempt Anthony. This man-creature gorged himself to the point of prostration. The stomach in place of the head is proof that his gluttony will always take precedence. The stomach will be his end, though he shows little concern for the dagger stuck in it. A childlike man of the cloth, a whirligig pierced through the flap of his hood, makes his way out of the painting with the help of a child's walking frame. The attacks of the devil on Anthony proved to be ineffective. The saint would gird his body with his faith, his prayers and his fasting. Sober and vigilant, knowing full well that the enemy would never cease to lie in wait. Anthony's gaze is not angled towards anything in this world. His soul is calm and full of peace. Nothing will separate him from the love of God. Euronymous Bosch's triptych altarpiece, The Temptations of Saint Anthony, opens the stage door to both tragic and hopeful destinies. The painting commemorates the life of a man who found himself in a condition of mind to fight off the delusions of the world, their absurdity and their emptiness. A man who sacrificed himself after the exemplary standard set by Christ, inspiring strength and resolve. A man who threw himself into solitude and prayer, believing in the promise of salvation. Uh-huh.